Last year, there were nearly 64 million vehicles recalled in the American market. This year, the number is 32 million and counting. The automotive industry has never seen anything like it. And that's because there's a new attitude in Washington, D.C., and especially at the agency that's tasked with regulating automotive safety, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA as it's called, is cracking the whip. Recently, I sat down with Mark Rosekind, the new administrator at NHTSA, to talk about this development. We especially focused on the big recall at Fiat Chrysler, and shortly after that interview, NHTSA fined Fiat Chrysler $105 million, an all-time record by the agency. Later in the show, I'll also be talking with a company that's developed the technology to fix cars using over-the-air updates. This could make it far easier for automakers to fix defective cars while they're parked, wherever they are. We'll get to that later, but first we start out with Mark Rosekind, the administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Mark Rosekind, you've stepped into running the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration at probably the most tumultuous time in its history. Coming in as an outsider, I'm very curious to know, what have you encountered that is something you really did not expect and what are the, some of the positive things too that you found since you've taken over sure it's actually been a pretty amazing experience actually so i just came from being a board member at the ntsb national transportation safety board so all about safety but it's been unbelievable to sort of land in NHTSA at this particular time to see what's going on one of the biggest surprises is how diverse the portfolio is at NHTSA everybody's been focusing on defect recall the reality is the behavioral core safety programs as well as the technology innovations going on incredible and who knew but NHTSA looks over fuel efficiency EMS it's like unbelievable how diverse the portfolio is You've been talking a lot about how your agency is underfunded. What do you need specifically? I mean, everyone says, I need more money, but what would you use the money for? And, and I like to keep it in context, which is when I got there, they had already started, and I'm pushing even harder for internal changes going on. So we're going to do everything we can within the resources we have to do a better job faster and just improve. But at some point, when you get 80,000 complaints coming in and you only have eight people to look at them, it's simple math. So we have asked for more money. The president has asked specifically uh, to basically um, double our, I get this backwards sometimes, double our budget, triple our people, or the other way. <laughs> You're going to go, it, Anyways, you need more, yeah. And that's the issue, which is, you know, it's going to go right to our Office of Defect Investigations, basically, and we're going to get a chance to not just get the people, but also the technology and things we need to do a better job at screening and looking for defects. The sooner you get them, the sooner you get a chance to get those things off the road. One of the criticisms of NHTSA is that it's got disparate databases that they were not able to cross-link. These criticisms, by the way, come right out of NHTSA itself. It's not just outsiders. Is that one of the things that you really see necessary so you can do big data analytics? So you don't maybe need an army of people, but maybe some more that you can find out these things just by doing trend analysis. So even in my confirmation hearing, people, technology, authorities. And so you're to the technology part, and we have some really exciting modernization projects going on, as well as new ones. Connect the dots, those are trend analysis. In fact, if you look at the budget request, we're talking about a couple of new divisions. One would be a trend analysis, another is a specific crash investigation group. So data is core, everybody likes to think NHTSA, it's all about being data driven, but that's all in the service about safety, and that means saving lives and preventing injuries on the road. What's going on with the auto industry right now? I think 60 million vehicles will be recalled this year. When I look at all the independent quality ratings of the auto industry, they all look great. Everyone says, oh, quality's good and getting better. And yet you contrast that with 60 million recalls, and there seems to be some sort of disconnect. Well, and you're citing last year's record. So 2014, almost 64 million vehicles were recalled. And actually, early when I came on the scene, a lot of people were saying, you know, if you improve all these things that you're talking about, how will we know? whether or not there's an improvement. And I said, well, those recalls could actually go up. And we're starting to see that, of course, with Takata, which is affecting 32 million vehicles in that recall alone. So it is an interesting mixed message in the sense that the quality, the age of the vehicles, they're getting older, being around longer, uh, and yet at the same time we're seeing recalls. The best outcome we could have, though, is folks starting to identify all those recalls on the front end, identify the defect. So smaller numbers, getting them quickly means we won't go to these large kinds of recalls. What's changed, though? Because it's not as if all of a sudden cars got really bad and now we're seeing record recalls. It's 
I think the threshold is a whole lot easier today. Is that the case? Well, it's not so much easier, but I, I would say that NHTSA has really upped our focus on the safety part. So I'm constantly at safety, safety, safety. Got an issue, talk to us about safety, bring the data. And so right now, if anything, there's some very clear lines. Uh, timeliness, completion rates, you know, we're just being a lot more specific. So retooling recalls, an event we had, it was all focused on getting 100% completion rate. That's gonna have to raise the bar for everybody. Was it in the past too that the OEMs would just sort of say, well, let's just sort of see what happens rather than jumping on something? And again, I, I come back to, Cars today, and I test drive all of them, are very well built, and yet we've got recalls like we've never seen before. Yeah, and you got to give everybody credit. NHTSA has been on it, the OEMs have been on it, you know, the safety advocates have been on this. Again, raising the bar, uh, but there's no question that there's an increased vigilance. And so uh, for me, a lot of it's zero one. You know, either you meet the requirement and great, you get the gold star for doing that. And if you haven't, it's not timely, you haven't done what you were supposed to do reporting, then let's take care of that and get it improved. We've heard some CEOs at car companies say, hey, this is unsustainable. They're, they're, we can't even afford to recall these many cars. How, how do you balance that? I, I think I know where your answer is going to go, but I want to hear you say it. Because it's very direct for NHTSA. It's safety, safety, safety. And if that's not at the top, then you've got to rearrange the other priorities because it's all about saving those lives and making sure people aren't going to be injured when they're on the road. Everybody's expectations get to, from A to B safely every time. It should be that way. Do you see a real change at the OEMs? And let's start with General Motors, which, as you well know, hid this defect. Maybe the people at the top didn't know, but there were certainly people within General Motors that knew that they had an ignition switch problem, and they buried it. They, 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 they didn't let the information go anywhere. Do you see the, the mindset changing at the car companies? We believe that's underway, and it's been really nice to see that change that's evolving. Uh, and it's critical to do what you just did, and that is to identify you can't let them off the hook. That was a deception that interfered. Literally, people lost their lives. People were hurt, et cetera. At the same time, if they step up, lessons learned and ready to make changes, we have to do everything we can to support those changes. That will be good for them. It'll be good for the industry going forward. Right now at Chrysler, you've got an issue with this uh, uh, They've put on a trailer hitch to try to prevent uh, gas tanks from uh, rupturing and catching fire in an accident. Uh, you guys have accused them of dragging their heels. Chrysler itself has admitted it really hasn't handled this well. What's going on there? Well, and I'm glad you brought that up because what's happened is people focus so much on a particular Jeep, one Jeep and a particular issue, which is a concern. But we just had a hearing on July 2nd that identified 23 different recall issues with Chrysler affecting 11 million vehicles. So it's not about one, it's about a pattern of things that we've been seeing at Chrysler where they're slow, not reporting, not starting a recall they said they would, et cetera. So that docket just closed and we expect some action actually on our part, possibly by the end of the month. Why has Chrysler dragged its heels? Well, that's an important question uh, that we've been looking into to understand not just the what happened, they weren't timely, but why. And so that has led to some fundamental changes in their reporting systems, in their safety structure, uh, and a whole bunch of other pieces that need to be different if they're going to not just meet the law, but do a better job for safety. Is it a procedural issue or is it what the top management is directing their safety people to do? This is one of those, it's all of it. So it's the structure, it's their procedures, it's their quality assurance, uh, who's reporting to whom. Uh, you know, these are complex cultural issues actually where just changing one little piece won't get you a fix. And so I think that's what's important about going after 23 recalls, not one, because it's a much better chance to try and see the culture improve. You know, uh, there's gotta be consequences for the actions that corporations take. Toyota was fined $1.2 billion for not being proactive enough and open enough in its recall with uh, the sticky gas pedals and uh, the floor mats bundling up under the brake pedal and the like. What's GM going to face fine-wise? Well, uh, they've already, we're talking about Chrysler. All right, well, let's get to GM, Chrysler next. Want, yeah. I'm going back, I'm going uh, first General Motors. And that's why it's good because, you know, what you've seen as we've gone through here, and I'd actually talk about a few of them, people are focused on GM. What's happened at NHTSA is we've actually been evolving our tools so that we can go and get improved safety. And so in the consent orders that we've done, they've included things like monitors and increased reporting system and penalties. But the penalties haven't just been a check to the U.S. government. Some of them include forward spending on safety programs, which means we all 
benefit. Oh, explain a little bit more. I'm not familiar with that. Well, and this is one of those things that's very creative from our lawyers who basically are looking at enforcement is, you made a violation, you got to pay for it. So there's clearly a part of that penalty that goes directly to the U.S. government. But a lot of these have a carve out that goes specifically to spending some of that penalty money on safety programs. We just had Graco, uh, car seat, uh, you know, kid seat, uh, biggest recall ever in the car seat business, basically. And about a third almost of that penalty is going to safety programs for children and parents about car seats. So GM, I got to believe, is facing a bigger fine than Toyota did simply because the uh, the deaths involved and uh, the number of vehicles involved are so much bigger. Yes, and, and I think, again, most of that with the consent order and things are sort of past us now. Uh, now it's really a chance to try and see whether or not the culture change that you're referring to, we see those in the long term at GM. They're talking great stuff. We've seen a lot of concrete things, but it's not once. We have to see this ongoing for years into the future. If it's really going to make a difference. So there will be a carve out, as you, you use the term, and any potential fine that they face that and, would go to safety. And that's already happened. So there's part of that is going to safety-focused future-looking kinds of programs that will benefit all of us. Okay, let's talk about Chrysler. What kind of a fine could they face? Well, that's an interesting one because there are 23 different recalls here. And uh, a lot of people are trying to do the math, saying what's the maximum multiply of times recall. It's a little more complicated than that. Um, but I think there could be, there's the potential for a sizable penalty there. Again, if you learn what we have from the consent orders, it wouldn't be just writing a check for the penalty, but trying to find out what safety programs could be funded so we all benefit. More than just trailer hitches. Yes. And I think in this, we would be looking for you know, a broad array of tools. Again, monitors, uh, buybacks or potential. There's a whole suite of different things we could look at uh, that'll be determined hopefully fairly soon. Biggest recall in history, of course, involves the Takata airbag. Any updates that you can give us on that, how it's proceeding? Yeah, in fact, I'm really glad you asked about that because everybody's just focused on the big number. 34 million airbags in 32 million vehicles, probably the largest in U.S. history of any safety recall, certainly the most complicated. But the update, May 19th, we announced that NHTSA is in the driver's seat. We have uh, a comprehensive program we're doing now that's going to coordinate all of the remedy. And so we've been meeting with all of the OEMs and suppliers to get all of the information together so we can help come up literally with a national plan to make sure priorities and phased, everybody gets a safe airbag in their vehicle. And when do you think you might have that completed? So right now, our plan is to talk to these folks through the summer. And we're hoping in the fall to actually have a public event where we'll roll out this plan so everybody gets to see what's going to happen. And you're confident the replacement airbags that are going into cars are safe? Great question. Uh, that's been one of the issues. And up to this point, before May, when NHTSA was really uh, in the driver's seat, there was a lot of focus on the root cause, which is very important. But now that we can actually have some oversight in some direction, we're trying to make sure that a piece of that focus on testing is on making sure the remedy is effective. So now for the first time, we're going to make sure we guarantee that what goes in is going to be effective. But the really important point, right now, some people could be getting an airbag that's going to have to be replaced a second time. The key, they're not rupturing 7 to 12 years. So even if you get one now, as long as you get it fixed within the next year, two years, which is when we hope everything will be done, it's still better to have that safe airbag in there than the current one. How long should safety regulations apply to a car? You know, we used to call the life of a car 10 years. Now the average car is 11 and a half years old. Again, what a great question, because a lot of people are wondering if the way the rules were originally written apply to what's going on now. So that's one of the ones everybody wants to raise, which is, uh, as you know, the Jeep that you were talking about, part of the issue is it's out of the range of, but they're around so much longer. So that's one of the things we have to look at. Age is one of the concerns in the Takata airbag. Humidity, heat, and how old. Mark Rosegain, we're going to have to wrap it up, but thanks so much for sharing your time with me today. It's my pleasure. My second guest for the show is Ben Hoffman, the president and CEO of a tech company called Movimento. It's one of the companies that has developed a way to update the software in cars using over-the-air technology. OTA, as they call it, is going to take the automotive industry by storm. But let's listen to Ben Hoffman tell the story. Ben, as our viewers have just heard, there's all kinds of problems with recalls. You may have an, a, a solution here, a technological solution that could help the industry in a lot of ways. Let's talk about over-the-air updates. What is it? How is it going to help? Oh, great, great question, John. The, the, what an exciting time and space for connected vehicles, automotive, autonomous, and the really the mindset change to be software first and, and software-enabled and 
software defined car is a term that we use, which is a long term used in the networking space, used in the wireless space, software defined X. And now it's coming to car. So this is actually over the air. Just like I get updates for my cell phone or even my laptop, you're going to be able to do that with cars. Correct. Correct. The, the public is so comfortable with, they have the mobile device, they have the smartphone, the, the, the wireless device, they get informed. There's an update available, right? Three, four, five, ten apps need this update, here's why. Security fixes, feature enhancements, changes to the core firmware. So there's a, there's a customer expectation of it now and a realization that software is never done. It's just released. It's amazing that 25% of all recalls are never dealt with. 25% of car buyers out there just could not be bothered with a recall, even if it's a life or death situation. Right. Here's, you've got an opportunity here to even address those recalls. Oh, it's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity to, to drive the speed and the, that percentage, right? That becomes a non-issue now, especially for those safety critical and other factors that need to be done from a software perspective. So push it out, inform the customer, simple user interface. It's gonna be like their mobile device experience, again, that they're, that they're familiar with already, that they're comfortable. Some automakers have talked about having to put a modem literally on every component on the car, but your solution does it with one, is that Correct. right? multiple ways that the vehicles will be connected going forward. Embedded modems are becoming more and more standard, more common globally. That GM and OnStar have been leaders in that space. Tesla certainly got great publicity now. Uh, Jag Land Rover is public. Right? Others are public going forward. What does that look like? How do they make that, that approach? But Wi-Fi is gonna be part of the solution. Right? Ford has done that with uh, Sync 3. Mobile devices, tethered is the, is the term that a lot, a lot of people like to use. The mobile devices have great power, great technology, great memory space and access to do a tethered approach. So how they get there, a lot of options and flexibility, but getting it there through whatever the mechanism is, satellite delivery, right? There's, there's tremendous opportunity. And then now you can deliver that software over the air to a very large population in a very short period of time. So the traditional math and the data of how many vehicles are done, what percentage over what number of months, that's how they count it. With an over-the-air technology approach, it's 99 right, percentages in, in, in days and weeks. They're just a game changer for how you can address the software aspect of recalls and, and well, as well as all the other advantages of features and functions. Describe simply for us what Movimento is doing. I mean, what are you actually going to put in the car to enable this over-the-air update? So the Movimento approach is, is really from an automotive mindset. There's just a lot of technology out there coming into the car. The technology industry and some of the big tech players are bringing great value, but there's also a th this threat aspect. We're, we're, the automotive industry is a little bit uncertain and uncomfortable. We're an automotive company that has technology, and, and so bringing forward an onboard software approach that can integrate with existing vehicle architectures, legacy modules, so really to bring, bring forward a solution as quickly as possible. It doesn't have to be two or three generations of electrical architecture and vehicle launches later. What I'm uh, impressed with is this isn't just for recalls. This isn't just once the car's in the consumer's hands. You can really help automakers from a total manufacturing uh, efficiency standpoint right. with this. Right, from a life cycle perspective is what we like to look at, the product life cycle, vehicle development and engineering space. Managing the complexity of a vehicle, period, is very difficult. When you have soft parts, we call it, soft part complexity layered on top of the physical parts of doors and windows and bumpers and then the physical modules, it's an exponential problem. Managing that in vehicle development when the pace of change of software is weekly and daily is very complicated. Right? So there's a great value driver to more efficient and faster vehicle development, which everyone wants, right? You know the space, the industry's been talking about that for years. And there's even been some pushback now in the space, right? We're gonna slow down our vehicle development. Ford's been very public, others have been public. We're gonna slow down our development because of the concerns, a lot of that is software driven. So we're bringing some opportunities there. And in the manufacturing space, that soft part complexity is to some people still a bit of a mystery, an unknown. If you can do just-in-time software as part of the vehicle manufacturing process, great logistics save, cost efficiency, some security benefits. So it's really an exciting time to, to look at it from a life cycle view, not just an over the air, you know, consumer vehicle approach.
elaborate a little bit more on that because I think that's a really important part of this just-in-time delivery of software. What do you mean by that? So in the, in the traditional automotive world, you make hard parts, you, you sign off, everybody agrees, you have quality checks in place, and those parts don't really change much as the vehicle is built for the next maybe every year, every model year, they might have some modifications, but essentially it's fixed. Software doesn't play by those rules. Software has opportunities for improvements and changes and, and security patches or functional updates. It just, it's necessary. The supply chain is traditionally set up as I build those parts in one or two plants somewhere in the world. And this is, the supply chain is one week if you're close, two weeks, six weeks, 10 weeks. A lot of inventories, a lot just of sitting inventories there in transit. Moving on boats and trains and trucks sitting in the warehouse. Uh, if you want to change that software, it's a very time-consuming, out-of-process approach. The more you can drive, and we do this with some of our customers today, great advantage, the customers are thrilled. Update that software in a just-in-time way as the vehicle is built. Huge, huge opportunity to really change uh, some of that manufacturing process um, and, and really drive down a lot of the complexity and the delays in changing software, but it's a big, it's a big change, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do these things in the software way as opposed to a hard part way. Yeah, and let's go into that a bit more detail so our viewers understand. In an assembly plant, you have many different kinds of build combinations. Right. A vehicle might have a V8, a V6, it might have a six-speed, it might have an, uh, a, a CVT or something, and you need different modules coming down the assembly line, right. make sure the right computer goes in the right car. What you're saying is, no, just put in whatever computer and we'll zap the software right in there. That's right. So real examples the hard parts, right? the, the, the module itself, there might be a few variations for powertrain differences. A four-cylinder will need a different set of drivers and complexity of the, of the actual hardware itself than a V8 or a V6. But the software configurations are, are, are immense. Right? It's an exponential of that. Is it front-wheel drive? Is it rear-wheel drive? Is it an export market? Right? All of these, these different aspects. So what might be 40, 50, 60 different variations that if you don't have this just-in-time software capability, you're manually, you're manually tracking an inventory and expecting the people as part of assembly to pick the right ones. Just-in-time software, it, exactly. It's a generic load and then the right software specifically is put into that vehicle. What I like about this is even though your component is going to add some cost to the vehicle, there's efficiencies right. that are going to help mitigate that cost. Exactly. And, and our, our ad is minimal compared to, we're not, a, we're not a hardware ad. The hardware is going to be there. V, the OEMs are going to have connected vehicles. It's a requirement for safety. It's a requirement for autonomous. It's a requirement for customer expectation. Our ad is there, and, and, and you're right, and with the right application, our value starts to come into play, again, in the vehicle development space, in the manufacturing space, right? really throughout that life cycle. It's a tremendous return on what that investment looks like. Also, Tesla's talked about this, of doing over-the-air updates to enhance the car. Not, not just fix a problem, not address right. a recall issue, but actually to add capabilities to a car. Talk a little bit about that, fin would you? you know, that's, that's really one of the fun, exciting pieces. People don't like to talk about recalls. Real, right? It's very important, and it's a real value driver. Warranty is it's well known. Cost avoidance and all those topics are really going to be the value, you know, the, the, the first case drivers. But when you get to the customer satisfaction, and I can change the look and feel, I can do personalization. Tesla's great with their example of look, they're putting some semi autonomous driving functionality with a software update later this year for vehicles going back into production from last year. What a huge way to look at the difference and really a software first mindset. Uh, that's what makes the mobile devices on the, and the mobile technology so interesting. It's not the hardware. It's the ecosystem. It's the changes, the personalization that I can do to that product going forward and how I use it. One thing I don't like about getting updates on my uh, laptop especially is I can't use it until all the software has been loaded. It doesn't take all that long, but it could be a nuisance. In a car, it might be something different. So I might need my car right now. How do you deal with that? Great, great question. That's one of the real pushback points. I don't know when I'm going to need this. And, and the, the, the OEMs have years of experience of what does it look like? What are the failure modes that I need to be able to support? Multiple technology solutions to minimize the impact or completely eliminate the impact of that aspect. You don't have to wait, right? So there's technology. Dual bank memory is one approach. It's 
costly, it, it drives changes, but for some of those critical modules, the drivetrain modules, the infotainment system modules, that might make sense. For the others, it can be scheduled, can be done at night, right? It can be the customer can sign off and, and I give you, John, the option. You're driving home. Hey, this update is going to improve the performance of right, the, braking, the braking field. Right, that, that, here's the change. It's going to take 45 seconds to do that update. John, do you want to do it the next time you turn the vehicle off? No, I'm going to run in to get a coffee or run right back out. Or do you want to do it when you get home? Sure. Right, and that, and, and our technology with our automotive background and, and really our, our knowledge. We know what that looks like. We know what the conditions are to make sure it's okay to perform that update. Very good. We're down to the very end here, too. You, you said legacy systems. You can address systems that were never uh, designed for this. Correct. Because the systems, many of the systems were designed to have software updates done at the dealership. That's great. That means that the capability is there. Now you can layer on top these connected devices, right? A modem, the TCU, some of the head units are connected. Tethered approach. How do we, how do we make a software add to those systems with security in mind to allow us to then address the legacy systems? Great opportunity to go fast and help to address this problem. Fascinating. You know, there's a lot of issues out there in the industry right now, but maybe over-the-air updates can address a lot of them. Thanks so much, Ben. Thank you, John. The pace of recalls in the automotive industry is clearly unsustainable, and the auto industry is going to have to respond. Part of that will be with technology, just like Movimento is developing, but the industry is going to have to respond in other ways as well. And you can be sure that AutoLine will give you a front row seat as these events develop.